Welcome. In the next uh, five minutes or so, I'm going to be talking all about critical appraisal of randomized controlled trials. Uh, brief plug, uh, if you're a doctor, we have a podcast called The Rounds Table. It uh, keeps you up to date on clinical trials uh, related to internal medicine. And then Journal, a tool to hopefully waste less time when you're submitting manuscripts for publication. So I've boiled it down to a four-step process. Step one, you know, you got the article in front of you, scroll down to the last sentence of the introduction, and there you'll find the research question. Once you have the research question, you can use the PICO framework to assess the internal validity and external generalizability. Step three, integrate how biases could impact validity. And step four, there's a few other considerations. So step one, Let's scroll to the last sentence of the introduction and find the research question. And for this video, I'm going to be uh, focusing on the rapid trial. Uh, Dr. Michelle Schulzberg was the lead author, um, and I was uh, a part of this trial. So what was our research question? We can see here, last sentence of the introduction, that this rapid trial was designed to determine if therapeutic heparin is superior to prophylactic heparin in moderately ill patients with COVID-19 and increased D-dimer levels uh, admitted to hospital wards. So our research question here, we now know what it is. And we can use this PICO framework. So P, the population. This was patients hospitalized on the ward with COVID-19 and an elevated D-dimer. And I find this sentence allows me to identify, all right, is this going to be generalizable to my patients? And you can look at table one, you know, average age in the 60s, about half women. Certainly this is consistent with patients I've cared for on the internal medicine ward with COVID, maybe a bit younger than some of the individuals. So this will make me think about, hmm, you know, maybe these results won't apply to patients in their 80s and 90s, for example. Um, after we have the um, population uh, and we've understood that, the next step is the intervention. So in this case, we saw that it was therapeutic heparin. And a couple questions you want to ask yourself is, uh, was it blinded and how is the adherence? And then the comparator group uh, was prophylactic heparin. It's really important to ask is that clinically appropriate? Was it blinded and what was the adherence? So this was an unblinded randomized trial um, that we conducted. Um, how is adherence? Really good. You can see like 98% adherence in the two groups. Is prophylactic heparin clinically appropriate? Um, absolutely. Making this determination can be really hard if you're not a healthcare provider, um, but for anyone who's cared for patients with COVID-19, I think you would agree this is clinically appropriate comparator group. And then what's the outcome? So in this study, it was a composite of death, mechanical ventilation, or ICU at 28 days. And when you're reading any outcome in a randomized trial, you want to ask yourself, is this clinically relevant? Like, will my patients care about this? Was it blinded? How much missingness was there and was it clinically significant? So absolutely, this is clinically relevant, right? Death, mechanical ventilation, going to the ICU. Was it blinded? So in this case, our trial was unblinded. However, what we did was the outcome assessment um, or outcome adjudication that was blinded. So that's certainly helpful. And again, if there's a lot of missingness in your uh, outcome. It's going to be hard for a study to be of you know high validity. And then were the results clinically significant? Again, um, easy to determine if you're a healthcare provider, a little bit harder if you're not. So what we found was that at 28 days, the primary composite outcome occurred in 16% of individuals who got therapeutic heparin and 22% of patients who got prophylactic heparin. So really impressive absolute risk reduction, which would be, you know, 22% minus 16%. That's a 6% absolute risk reduction. And you can see the relative risk reduction here. Um, yes, the confidence intervals crossed one. I need to give a whole other talk about why just because the confidence interval crosses one, that doesn't mean that this is not informative um, and not helpful. Um, but again, that's a talk for another time. Uh, and then step three, you know, you're then integrating how these different biases um, could impact your validity. So if the researcher is unblinded in a trial, that can lead to surveillance bias, uh, or even um, uh, sometimes we call this as like detection bias. So, you know, like how they rate the outcome could be different if the researcher is unblinded. And, and that's why in our study, we made sure that the outcome adjudication was blinded to prevent against that.
If the patients are unblinded, such as in our study, you can have performance bias. Maybe patients act differently if they know they did or did not get the medication. If many patients are lost to follow-up, that's known as attrition bias. And what that creates is a very skewed sample of who's, who's left at the end. In our study, the loss to follow-up was very minimal, like less than 1%. If you find there's selective reporting of results, that of course can lead to reporting bias. So if researchers focus all on their secondary endpoints and not their primary outcome, you should be worried that there might be selective reporting of results. And then certainly if the intervention and the comparator group are followed differently, that can lead to surveillance bias. In our case, we followed the two groups the same. You know, we checked in on their blood work, vital signs every single day. But you could imagine if you if you treated one group differently, that could really affect your results. And then finally, there's a few other considerations uh, and questions to ask yourself. If it was a single center study, it's at high risk of spurious or non-generalizable results. Um, our study was conducted at, oh geez, I believe 20 some odd hospitals. Um, who funded the study? Uh, obviously, if it's funded by a pharmaceutical company, it might be at higher risk of spin, so sort of spinning the results uh, positive. Um, our study was not funded by industry. And then the data analysis intention to treat is ideal for most randomized controlled trials, and that's what we did in, in our case. If you're not sure what on earth that means, um, maybe I'll save that for uh, a, a, another video. And then I've buried my lead a bit, but assessing whether or not there was concealed allocation is really important. You know, so could the researcher have predicted what the patient was randomized to? Whenever you see a study where it was a randomized trial and we used sealed envelopes um, that we were given to researchers and they opened it up to determine if they were randomized to, you know, drug or placebo, that's at high risk of, of, of no concealment of allocation. You know, you can look through the light and see, oh, this is going to be uh, randomized to this or that, and that can affect your behavior. So what you want to see is sort of central randomization with a computer-generated random sequence. This is ideal to ensure there was concealed allocation. So again, I sort of see this as a four-step process. Um, I hope this is helpful. In the future, I'm going to start posting videos um, where I critically appraise articles. So hopefully, you'll get some more exposure and practice as a result. And again, if you're a researcher yourself, you want to spend less time uh, wasting your time on journals that create work for you, you can check out our website, um, journal.com. Uh, thanks so much. Have a great day.